Hello. Hello, everyone. And uh, welcome to the William H. Hannon Library's third annual LU Speaks. <laughs> Every year we have this uh, beautiful Vanderbilt family suite overlooking the ocean and the snow-capped mountains when they're not covered in clouds. And, and we get to enjoy the wine and cheese and various nibblies. It's a wonderful life. So how many people uh, have, have been to this event before? Just show hands. Nice, awesome, welcome back. And how many people first time? Cool, very cool. And how many people are simply here because they wandered in seeing the wine and cheese and various nibbles? <laughs> they got quiet when everyone sat down. All right, one guy, one guy. Who else wants to own it? So maybe a guy in the bathroom. All right, very good. Um, doesn't matter. Either way, welcome. You are in for a treat, truly. Uh, I am Lynn Mitchell Parrish. I had the privilege of speaking at the uh, first LMU Speaks and sharing my story. And I basically just never left. Um, I, I come back over here, they didn't even invite me here. I just kind of <laughs> snuck in, grabbed the mic before anyone else did, and no one's really stopping me, so we're all good. <laughs> nice. Seems to be going okay. So, in case you don't know, um, I work here on campus in IT. Uh, they, yeah, thank you. Ooh, what was that? Oh, right there. Nice, good to see you. Well done. Well done. Um, <laughs> as the manager of uh, business operations and assets and pots and pans and various other hardware. So it's, it's a glamorous job. Uh, and it makes sense because when you're selecting an MC, you're thinking warm, fuzzy, <laughs> rip roaring comedy. Uh, you naturally just the mind goes to IT. <laughs> You know us, we are hilarious people, it just makes sense. <laughs> Thank you everyone for, for, for being here tonight. Uh, we really, uh, really appreciate it. Um, it's good, this is one of the reasons why this event is really great because uh, every day you're walking around campus, you're seeing familiar faces, you may know people's departments or titles, but tonight it's not about uh, what we do, it's about who we are. It's about building community and sharing stories, which is what libraries do, right? right? And we're very interested in hearing from you as well, so on your seat when you got there, there was a, a feedback card. Would please take a minute after this, yes, fill it out. Come put it in this lovely box right here. Uh, we do read them, we are very interested in your thoughts and suggestions, and we do incorporate a lot of the feedback, so please could take a moment to do that. Uh, we would really appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Um, so tonight, uh, we have, uh, uh, we typically invite uh, about four or five speakers in this event to come and share their stories uh, and so we can get to know them a little bit better. And we do, uh, we do encourage them to be as deep and as real as they feel they need to be and sometimes it gets very raw. So if anyone here is listening and is made uncomfortable by anything you hear, please feel free to step out. We want anyone to be comfortable and, and so no one think anything about it if you're feeling a lot just step out, but otherwise it should be a great night. Um, we have four speakers here tonight, and so I will introduce each one only briefly, uh, and then I will get out of the way. Uh, that's, how, that's how that works. Uh, um, but with the stories, uh, we do give everyone a common theme uh, to kind of help focus it, and typically it uh, pinpoints a critical moment in a person's life when uh, all of a sudden, and then from that moment on, things were just going to be different. Because that's the moment that we find that we define or confirm or maybe even reinvent who we are. And those are the stories that draw us in and endear us to one another. Right? So the first year we went, uh, came to the fork in the road, that was the first year. The second year we went off the rails entirely. And this third year, we have decided to select America's Facebook relationship status. <laughs> it's complicated. <laughs> it, it is a little too complicated. So please sit back and relax or lean in and connect, whatever feels right, uh, to the library's third annual LMU Speaks. It's complicated. Thank you. Our first speaker tonight is an undergraduate student. So we welcome McKean Yassar. Testing, one, two, one, two. Can you hear me? Yeah. Perfect. Assalamu alaikum. Just say. Welcome, Assalamu 
welcome to the Hello everyone, my name is Bikini Sagar, and the greeting that I just gave you is the greeting amongst Muslims. Asalaamu Alaikum. And it is Arabic for May peace be upon you. And the reason why I give you all that greeting is because before I start my story, I want to share with you a quote. A quote that has had a profound effect on me in terms of the way I think about change, making change, and having responsibility to act. And that quote is from Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may peace be upon him. And any quote from the Prophet Muhammad is called a hadith, and this hadith goes, Whosoever of you sees an evil, let you change it with your hand. And if you are unable to do so, then change it with your tongue. And if you are unable to do so, than with your heart. For me, I used to always think of change in terms of stark contrasts and low defined differences. I used to think of walls being torn down or the embers burning from the remnants of the fire. I used to think of people organizing in mass to challenge and triumph over evil. And I always wanted to be a part of that change. And for the first time ever last year, I was able to see myself in that change. Because 2018 was by far the most impactful and important year of my entire 21 years of life. Oh, y'all. Oh, okay. I see it in your eyes. I see it in your face. I can hear your thoughts already. You guys are. Okay. So I know what y'all are thinking. Entire life? <laughs> too young to be talking about your entire life. And listen, I get it. I get it. I'm young. And I get it. I have a baby face. <laughs> but despite those two things, regardless of those two things, last year was one hell of a year. And I'm sure some of you guys are wondering, okay, well, what made that year so transformative for you? Well, I'll tell you. I'll keep it real. I'll keep it honest. I was killing it last year. <laughs> I was on my stuff. Listen, I was on fire last year. It was absolutely incredible. Do we have any basketball fans in here? Okay, we got a couple. And Lakers fans, specifically. There we go. Lakers fans strong. <laughs> Alright, do y'all remember that season in 2009-2010 where Kobe had like some like 10 game winners, right? And then he went to the playoffs and the finals. He was averaging 30 plus points a game. And we ended up winning the championship against the Boston Celtics. Last year was my Kobe year. <laughs> I was balling. I was absolutely balling. I'll tell you how I was balling. First things first. I was doing research with one of my professors, right? Uh, my major is health and human sciences, and we're doing research on the appropriate reception of those with past and custom history. I'm talking data collection. I'm talking abstract right? I'm talking student training, you know, the whole nine yards, poster creation. Sounds cool, right? Even better, during that time, simultaneously, I was writing a grant proposal for a project to the Strauss Foundation. And we'll put a little note on that, and we'll get back to that. But during this time, it was a very, very important time. So, you know, look at that note. It's there. Okay. Next, I was also working on campus as a manager for our school's event operations. I went to the poster competition, undergraduate poster competition in Atlanta. I went to Atlanta. I was also, uh, I had the honor of becoming a Daniel K. and Noe Tomodachi scholar. This means that I was able to go to Japan for the first time. I was the first of my family to ever go to Asia. I was one of the few people to ever leave the country in my family. I was running programming for Japanese students. I was doing college awareness programs, running field trips. I was doing tutoring sessions at Westchester High School through a service club on campus called Harambe Mentorship. Everything was just going, 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 bye, bye, bye. And one day, on my managership, I got a call from a Mr. Duncan Strauss. Now, for those of you who don't know, the Strauss Foundation is a philanthropic organization that funds scholarships and grants to undergraduate students for public service projects, whether it be domestic or international. And so, for the proposal that I pinned right here, I was writing a proposal that was for a project called the Emotion Health Project. And the Emotion Health Project was going to be a project that was a health exposure program at Westchester High School that focused on college awareness, academic preparedness, health education, direct professional exposure for students at Westchester High School and was going to culminate in a community event, specifically a community health care, that was meant to connect our resources here to the greater Los Angeles community. 
and I was getting a call because I had done I had won. <coughs> the very next week, I got an LMU Student Service and Leadership Award. I got straight A's on 18 credits. I won my championship. And how did I celebrate, you may ask? I went to Disneyland. No, I didn't go to Disneyland. <laughs> I didn't go to Disney. I did something that was tenfold better. I took a study abroad trip, three weeks intensive summer abroad trip to Ghana. A completely life changing experience. I was able to go to Japan again for another program. I got a new job as a medical assistant. It was one of the best things ever. And I wanted to keep pushing. I had to. I wanted to keep pushing hard. Because coming back, heading into the fall semester, you know, if I'm going to be Kobe, I had a repeat. <laughs> Mama mentality. I was motivated, inspired. I was clear headed. I knew exactly what I had to do. I was going to create this brand new program at Westchester High School. I was going to be a model for other LAUSD schools. I was going to help become an advocate for change. I was going to be this health advocate. I was going to be this educational advocate. I was going to take 20 credits of classes and get straight A's. <laughs> exactly. Get back to that. <laughs> But you know, why not? Because of how things have gone, I knew that they were gonna keep going well. So I was like, I need to keep pushing. I need to keep giving my all. I was going to take another trip to Ghana again through a program here called Alternative Breaks at the end of the semester. Because again, why not? And I was going to find new ways to be able to liberate my people. I was going to make change. And during that time, it was really great because people were giving thumbs ups, they were giving hats on backs, and they were like, you're doing amazing, oh my god, we're so proud of you, you're just incredible, how are you able to manage all of this, how are you able to do all of this, and this is insane, <laughs> and how, how was I able to do it? But the thing was, I wasn't able to do it, not at all. Immediately from the jump, I started finding I started finding difficulties starting the program at Westchester High School. It was difficult uh, in terms of outreach to students, uh, coordinating with administration and teachers, finding champions on the campus. Um, the communication wasn't there. I spent hours and hours on end, jumping back and forth between Westchester and LMU. I was already falling behind my proposal. Then I had gone to another conference, came back. And I was already behind on my classes mid-September, fall semester. I had done another undergraduate poster competition, which was fun. And the very next week, I got into a car accident. And I couldn't drive my car anymore. And the whole time, I was just constantly thinking, how am I going to pay for these damages? And then I started falling behind financially as well. And just to give a little bit of context, um, there were also a lot of things happening at LMU last semester during this time. Uh, there was a student group on campus who was directly provoking students, specifically black students. We had guest speakers who were uh, promoting this very inflammatory language, very divisive. They were denying that racism existed. They were verbally attacking student protesters on the spot in front of the administration. The very next week, we had a fake on campus <coughs> shooting, just two days removed from the Thousand Oaks shooting. And I found myself in the middle of it all trying to mitigate, organize, and just act out and challenge everything, act out against everything. And the worst part of it all was that I didn't know how to fix anything. The week before Thanksgiving break, I just done another workshop at Westchester High School. I passed out in my car for two hours. I drove back to my apartment in the family car, my parents let me borrow, and punched the wall, sprained my finger, just out of frustration. When I had gone home, I was bedridden for 
us in yourselves. And then when I got back, I canceled everything. I was just like, let me just focus on my classes. I just need to catch up. I had six classes worth of material that I just couldn't understand. Things I was able to understand, I couldn't remember. I wasn't eating. I was sleeping heavily. I wasn't talking to anybody because I couldn't let them in that. But just so many things that I couldn't fix so prompt. So many promises that I couldn't keep. <coughs> when I got home, my heart was heavy, my pride was bruised, my grace had completely tanked. I developed a mental pause and a verbal study. And I wasn't able to tell anyone because I didn't want anyone to hear me. For all they knew during that break, I was in Ghana. So I spent the entirety of those four weeks sleeping 12 hours a day and getting back on a normal living schedule for the weight that I had lost. It's complicated. Because all this happened very recently. The story isn't necessarily over. But I'm not necessarily the same person I was last year versus now. Tolerance for stress is much lower. I still have trouble focusing. I diagnose anxiety. My depressive symptoms, they come and go. But it's not that I'm just scared of the fact that I don't know how things are going to turn out, or that I'm scared that I won't be able to do the things I sought out to do, but it's that I'm here standing in front of you all and you can see me. I've always held myself to a very, very high standard, I mean, almost unreasonable one, admittedly. I always felt that my blessings were a privilege and that they were meant to be shared with others. And to do anything otherwise would be a waste of that blessing. I had the tools and the keys to success and success was and is the only option. Success is the only option when your community doesn't have the privilege of being in the same space as you to be able to benefit from these opportunities. Success is the only option when there are people in your community who will never be the same age as you in the same space. The success is the only option when there are people dying. It is. Albeit, during the same time, I'm still trying to manage family bonds, professional networks, um, friendships, my personal relationship for four years. During that time. So I started thinking about change differently because one thing I recognized was that these aspirations could not come at the expense of my well-being. I would be no good to know. I started thinking of change differently. I started thinking in terms of the seed that is planted and the tree that blooms thereof. I started thinking about change in terms of the grass that sprouts after the barren winter. I started thinking of change as growth. And even just recently, I started thinking about change in terms of the minutia of changes of, at the cellular level, the cellular division, the seepage of nutrients into the roots. I started thinking about the conversion of water and light into cellular <coughs> sugar and air. I started thinking about the minutia in myself and the changes that were going on in myself. I started to get change in terms of me getting my sleep and that being changed, in terms of me eating more than just half a meal a day and that being changed. Of, me taking time for myself, saying no to meetings, being kinder to myself, exercising after not doing so for half a year, and all of that being changed, and me being able to share this with you all and not feel like a burden. And so as I start noting the changes within myself, I can only hope that my seats will bloom. And before I 
before I finish, I would like to share with you one more quote from the Quran, Surah Al Baqarah, chapter Ayat 216. There may be something that you love that is not good for you. And there may be something that you dislike that may be good for you. Indeed, Allah knows all you know not. Thank you. Our next speaker uh, is an instructor in the rhetorical arts out of the Valerine College of Liberal Arts. Uh, please welcome Lynn Bois. I was born in Vietnam, and soon after the war ended, my family and I, we fled Vietnam, and we became a part of the one million who left the country. Um, and then we also became only the 50% that survived. So this is me in the refugee camp. I'd like to, I don't know if you can see my barrette, but I do have a barrette. Uh, <laughs> So this meant that in the late 1970s, my family and I, we spent some time in the refugee camps in Malaysia. It also meant that I had to learn English as a second language. But more importantly for me, it gave me a really deep relationship with language and narrative in general. So I used this um, for most of my life to read stories, and I went on to get um, you know, my degree in literature, in African American and Asian American literature specifically. But the stories that I'm going to tell you tonight um, might suggest that, you know, that language really isn't my thing. And that I think that's true, you know. Um, but I'd like to try to see this not as a deficit, but rather as an asset. And the reason I say that is because I think that my difficult relationship to language has really given me an appreciation for language, not just as an instrument of communication, but um, as a receptacle for our histories. And so hopefully, by the end of my time, that will make more sense to you. Um, so I'll start by telling you about a, an interaction I had with my third grade teacher, <coughs> Mrs. DeCoop Crank. Mrs. DeCoop Crank. Loved her. Loved all my teachers. Um, as a third grader, I was speaking English. I, I was um, not yet fluent. I was learning it. But just like any other third grader, I was also learning how to translate my verbal English into my written English. So in that way, I wasn't really any different right, from, from a nine, nine-year-old. But what I felt in retrospect was different was that I didn't have that contextual um, that I didn't, I wasn't fluent in the contextual aspect of language, which for me means that I wasn't really able to explain what I meant when I said something. <laughs> so Mrs. De Kukrank, um she, <coughs> she pulled me aside one day and she showed me some words that I had written, some sentences, and she had circled a few, wor a few words. And these were the words that she circled mine as well. And she said to me, Lynn, what do you mean by this? You know, I, it doesn't quite make sense. Can you explain what you mean? And of course, as a, any third grader might, I said, Mrs. DeCoupe-Crank, I'm just not fluent in the contextual aspects of language. <laughs> Can I explain this to you? You know, obviously. No, but So no, what I did was, you know, I don't know. If you don't know, how am I supposed to know? Sorry. And we just kind of left it at that. Um, I didn't harbor resentment. I, there was no deep meaning for me at the point, at, the, at that moment. Um, and in fact, I really just plain forgot about it until another 
day in college when I was writing a paper for an English uh, class. And I typed these words, might as well. And for some reason, oh, that's what I meant in the third grade when <laughs> Mrs. DeCoupe-Crank asked me, we might as well go to the store, we might as well go to the store. Same thing, right? Might as well, let me see, might as well, might as well. <laughs> to me, the same thing. But it really wasn't that I didn't know might as well until college, right? I, it, it was just that I didn't put the two things together. And so that clarity was really actually a big moment for me. And um, I, I remember feeling like I wanted to reach out to Mrs. Dukukran. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't. Um, so I think, you know, I, I start with the story, but I don't want you to get the impression that, that it's English or that it's school that makes language difficult for me. Because actually, probably like most of us, language begins at home and in the family space. And so that's where much of my difficulty originates. Sorry, mom. Sorry, dad. Um, but actually, it's my grandmother that was the storyteller in my family. Um, and when I say storytelling, I really should say interjection or statement, because they weren't elaborate narratives. We weren't sitting around a campfire. We didn't have family story time. It just wasn't, it wasn't our thing, you know. Um, but what we did do was work. <laughs> my mom and my grandmother um, brought home bags and bags and bags of clothes from the local um, garment factory. And as quickly as my mom could sew pockets and buttons and edges, she would hand them to me and my sister and we would trim off the excess thread. And for every piece that we completed as a family, we got three cents. I tell you that story not because I remember it as toil. I'm sure it was for my, my parents. But for me, it was just family time. And during that, those times, you know, it was when my grandmother would say something about below freedom. And this was the place that we stayed at in, um, in Malaysia, the refugee camp. Um, so when she says these words, it means, I hate to say it, it doesn't mean much to me, because I know we were there, but I can't visualize it, right? And even if I look at photos, that's not my memory. So, um, so it remains abstract. But there was another statement or interjection that she would often tell, even more often than below freedom. And that was the encounter that we had with pirates on our journey. And she said that um, pirates boarded our raft, picked up my sister and I, and threw us into the ocean. And she was very clear that if it hadn't been for her, my grandmother, who dove into the ocean to get us out, that we wouldn't be here alive today. Um, so you can imagine, I had a hard time visualizing. Captain Hook with his black hat, his long red <laughs> coat, his sword, and then his hook, boarding my raft. I couldn't picture it. I really I couldn't, right? And even more, I just couldn't picture my grandmother diving into that wishing to save us. But I, I guess she did. Um, but it wasn't that I didn't believe her. It was just more that I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, figure it out. I couldn't visualize it for myself, from my own memory. Um, and it wasn't until junior high school, when I was doing what any other junior high school student would do, I was reading the National Geographic. True story. Love National Geographic. I know it's problematic, but that's, that's over there. <laughs> that's over there. So I was reading an article, and I came upon, just accidentally again, something on Thai pirates. And the fact that Thai pirates were ransacking and robbing um, fishing boats in the Ch South China Sea. And it's, and it's just that moment I was like, oh, pirates that weren't Captain Hook, right? <laughs> that my grandmother didn't have the Captain Hook con context to steer me this way. And so it wasn't necessarily that I needed National Geographic to legitimate what my grandmother was saying. It was just I needed the context of the now, of the fact that piracy wasn't a costume or a, con a, 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 
a character, but that it was the act of robbing and stealing. Um, so that made things a bit more concrete. I can I can start to visualize, you know, pirates and not so much the being thrown overboard, but it started to make more sense. So, um, but this last part of the story that she tells us still is difficult for me. And I say difficult meaning not traumatic because I don't remember it, but difficult in the sense that I have, I can't remember it, right? Um, and she said when we arrived to the shores of Malaysia that she buried me and my sister in sand to save us. Yeah, I don't know if you're trying to envision. I still can't. I mean, my my questions are: Was my head out? Was my like what? What was the configuration exactly? Um, and I I I still don't know. But I got a little closer to the memory about two years ago. Again, just purely accidentally. Um, I was doing some research on the tourism industry in Asia. And I was looking on, a screen, um, on the screen of a map of uh, Malaysia, and I noticed some dots um, on the coast. And so I zoomed in. And I saw materialize, just like literally right in front of me, the literalness of below freedom. Below freedom. Below freedom. <coughs> yeah, I just got chills myself. I, enough for you guys, I think. I mean, it still feels really mm. like, wow, this is how language comes together as a receptacle for me, always in, like accidentally, never because I search for it, but um, that's my story. So thank you for the, mm. the chat. To you. Why we do this event? It's just to have a moment to, to get to know people in a totally different way. It's really, really nice. Um, our next speaker is another undergraduate student. Please welcome Elsie Maras. really hard to support the actions she was taking and the decisions she was making. 
As much as I cared for her, it got really, really, really hard to like the person that I loved so much. And I share this because that type of feeling that I had with my friend at one time is now how I feel about my hometown. I grew up in Lamont, California, um, went to school in Arvin, California, and now we're side of Bakersfield, California. So I am a Kern County girl through and through. <laughs> and I love that. I am so proud of where I'm from, and no matter how much people like talk down on the 661, I will always rep it. <laughs> I love that place, and I'm so proud to be from there. Um, my hometown is a Latino community made up largely of immigrants, including my parents, who are just chasing the American dream. Um, everyone there is hardworking, resilient, hopeful, loving, very close-knit. It's very small, especially the Mont Um And people are just my, they're just like my people. That's who I am and that's who I'll always be. I've always felt, no, I've always known that when I grew up, my, my calling was to represent the people that no one else is fighting for. And that was my people. No one else is standing up for what, we, what was going wrong, so I was going to do it. And I try to live out this like feeling, this like feeling, this like calling for purpose from a very young age, from tutoring, coaching, volunteering at hospitals, mentoring special needs kids, organizing clothes drives, food drives, all that type of stuff. Anything that I could like support or commit to to help people out. Never would I have imagined that the only thing that hurts more than being away from home is being home. Hmm. It wasn't always like this, but like I said, it's complicated. <laughs> So I guess the best place to start would be the end of my junior year of high school. I was kind of on a high. I had just been elected student body president. Um, I had finally pastored my local assembly member enough to create an internship just so I could have that internship and represent the law in our which are particularly politically neglected. I was on my way to compete in international academic competitions to represent my low income, my low income high school and I was so excited to do so. Um, basically, I just felt like my dreams of being the servant leader that I had always wanted to be were finally started to be re were finally starting to be realized, and I just could not be more pumped. Um, it was a natural to see when my team was prepping for our very first competition to move on to the next round when things kind of took a turn. So I was competing, and luckily our practice prompt was something that we actually deal with: ice cooperation with police. And so it was, a project, it was a topic I get pretty close to home because we had already been going to city council meetings about making an Argo Sanctuary City, yada, yada. Basically, we knew we had to do that. But um, I got a series of texts from an unknown number. And so these texts, I would check them out, right? So I was like, see, I was like, what did my parents make me or something? And it was a series of texts ranging from insults on my appearance, um, attacks on my character, um, and so, like, even some, like, just saying, like, oh, like, you should die. Um, I, one sticks out of my mind just because of the nature of how ridiculous it was. It was, um, keep eating chips, get cancer, and die. You'll do us all a favor. And, yeah, these are mean, but I'm a very competitive person. And I was about to go on, so I kind of just brushed them off. Which kind of sounds insane, but I just wanted to win, you know? So, I didn't think much of it. And I was like, whatever. Things happen. Okay. Little did I know that this is only going to be the beginning of a very long school year. So I started school, and by the time that it rolled around, I had pretty much figured out who was behind the text. I mean, they weren't really hiding much. Um, unfortunately, two of the people were on my leadership team. So as we were setting up for our very first Welcome Back to School dance, it was Alice in Wonderland themed, a black light dance. Um, someone decided to hang up a Make America Great Again poster. And so, I kind of looked at that, and my team kind of looked at that, and we were like, what does that have to do with this? Like, <laughs> okay. And so as president, it was my responsibility to obviously ask that it be removed or taken down on the grounds of it being not only completely irrelevant to our event, but also just insensitive to like the student population. So immediately he pushed back, and he said, you're impeding on my free speech. Um, you're implying that I'm racist when I myself am a child of immigrants, and um, just, you know, that type of stuff. People on my team were mad obviously, pushed back at him. Many of the people on my team were undocumented. Um, it was just an insensitive conversation. So I was like, okay, let's take a step back. Let's calm down, let's all step outside. Have an early lunch. Lunch was not for an hour, but like we were like, whatever, let's just do it now. So we had our subway, and we walked back inside, and the poster had not only been taken down, but ripped apart. So immediately, um, he accused me of doing it. 
Now let me just say right now that if I ever take down the Trump poster, I will absolutely take this credit for that. Like, <laughs> like that, that's on me. Like that, I probably would have done it, honestly. But um, it wasn't me. And his anger at me was not only misdirected, but extremely over the top. He was screaming at me in front of the team, um, basically saying that I talk too much, that I'm too bossy, that I'm like on my high horse, and that he doesn't know who I think I am, but someone needs to put me in my place. All this stuff, not too different from things I had been hearing my whole life without me talking too much, and especially as being a woman in the Latino community. And then he stormed out and he left. And I thought that was the end of it. Obviously, I was embarrassed. My pride was a little bit hurt that in one of our first setup events with me as the leader, there had been such a nasty display and conflict. But um, everyone was super supportive and we moved on. And I thought that was the end of it. Little did we know that after we all left, he was going to come back and hang another poster, a larger one. He brought his own ladder, and he hung another larger Make America Great Again poster above anyone's reach. And beside that, another poster with the letters F. E. He would later go on to claim that this stood for free education, <laughs> but at the time was telling anyone who would listen that this stood for bug policy. And it only got worse from here. So, the school year went on, and I was just trying to ignore him. You know, I was a senior, I was so pumped about like my leadership role. But I just I had so much drive and motivation. I started off the school year just I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and we're going to be great, and it's gonna, I'm going to be the best president the school has ever seen. Um, so he tried a new method, and he tried to go after me in ways that I guess he knew that would hurt. Um, especially because when he would attack my character, like people would often defend me, but when you make sexually explicit comments about a girl, it's pretty normal at my school. So when he started doing that, no one really challenged him, and especially if it was around guys, including people who I considered friends, they were often just laughed at. And so I was kind of used to it, you know, like most girls in public high schools, so the 2,700 students are. It's just something that happens. But it was just the nature of what was being said and the excessiveness that just really started to get under my skin. Um, it got to the point where he was very openly telling people that um, the cure to shut me up and the cure to get me off my perceived high horse and my perceived high pedestal was just I just needed to be raped. And he said that pretty much verbatim. And so I started to feel pretty uncomfortable in my own skin. Um, I'm sure not everything got back to me, but a good part of it did. And when it did, um, I started to feel like just really dirty, if that makes sense, as if it was coming out of my own mouth. Um, and I responded to this for whatever reason by just projecting like a super happy-go-lucky, cheery person. Like, I don't care. So let me let you in on a little secret that I learned then. Anyone who's constantly telling the world how at peace and content they are is really trying to convince themselves more than anyone else. <laughs> and that is exactly what I was doing. So I was constantly just talking about how great things were, but I was really just feeling, starting to feel like super unsafe at my school. Um, and I don't think that anyone really understood that. A lot of people were mad at what was being said, but no one really understood how just uncomfortable I felt and how my sense of self was being started. We were playing along, it was like mid-November, and things were going, I'm going to say okay, but they weren't. Um, and I didn't think things could get any worse, but I thought wrong. So I get to school one day, and um, my friends bombarded me, and they showed me an Instagram account. And on this account were pictures of myself, my friends, um, my even one with my cousin, which is super weird, and they were pulled from my own pages, my own, like, Facebook and Instagram, etc. Just like pictures that I had posted when it was okay with being online, obviously. Um, but they had an added detail. So someone had photoshopped a porn logo onto each of them. So each photo said like browsers or Pornhub or XXX videos. I can't even remember the rest. And they were captioned really inappropriately. I don't feel it's necessary to share, but if you've got any notion of the other past comments, it's kind of like what it was along the lines of. And so my friends thought it was hysterical. It was just normal. They thought it was really funny. The pictures that they were included in, they were screenshotting it, sending it around, circulating the photos even further. And for whatever reason, I laughed with them. I Maybe it's because I didn't know how to react, or maybe it's because I didn't see the point in trying to show people why this should bother us. And so I was like, okay. 
And for the rest of the day, people were showing me over and over and over again. And my mind was telling me, like, you should be upset, like, you should say something, but, like, I didn't really see the point in it, really, so I was just like, whatever, let's just, it'll blow over soon, everything does, and there will be a new thing to talk about tomorrow. So on the last day, the last period of the class, we started every English class in meditation. So I closed my eyes, put my palms out, and just, like, waited for, like, the calmness of the study breathing to hit me. I hated meditating, but I did it. And, um, <laughs> for a great. And, um. But instead of the calm hit me, suddenly, like, my thoughts were, like, spiraling, and I was starting, my thoughts, they were just starting to race, and I was thinking, like, every single rape joke and degrading comments, and now these, like, Instagram captions, and every, like, the pictures and everything that had been said was just, like, going around in my mind, and before I knew it, I was, like, sweating, which was weird, and then I was, like, I, I felt like I was about to start hyperventilating, and obviously everyone's meditating, so it's a quiet classroom, so it was like my body was on autopilot, which had never happened before. I got up and I walked out of the classroom, and I just went to the office, and I just stayed there for the rest of the period. I didn't know why. I didn't, I feel like, I still feel like I didn't make the decision to do that. My body just did it for me. Um, so I went to the office, and I stayed there for the rest of the day, and um, I didn't really say anything, I just kind of stayed there. And then after class, I went back to my teacher's classroom to apologize for walking out, and she suggested that that was an anxiety attack. And at the time, anxiety seemed like a very white concept to me, so I was that. I was like, that doesn't happen to us. Like, that's <laughs> That is a you problem. Um, so, so I went along, but like honestly, after this day, things kind of went like downhill. I just I didn't necessarily attribute it to what was going on, but I just felt like a failure in every sense of the word. I wanted to be a good president, and I wasn't. I wanted to be there for students and support people, and I wasn't. I wanted to be the best intern that they had ever seen, and I wasn't. I wanted to be a social butterfly like I had been, and I was spending my lunches and my nutrition in a, my favorite teacher's classroom. I wanted to just be someone, and I was falling so short. So I was just constantly so disappointed in myself. I let my class rank drop. I, I got a truancy letter for not showing up to school. I was just a completely different person. And so I'd say they got to me. But I never really like addressed it. I never even told my parents any of this. Like I just kind of went along. So needless to say, I arrived to college with a lot of baggage. Um, and I didn't know what quite to make of what had happened, but I just came and I was just like, okay, let's just do this thing, I guess. Um, and surprisingly, I was doing okay. I made friends, I joined clubs, I was doing okay in my classes, and I was just overall just feeling like more and more like the person I had known before. The more I liked it here, the less I wanted to go home, which is weird because I was a very family-oriented person, I was homesick a lot. But then I would go home and slip back into that hopeless feeling and like that just like slight panic almost that would overcome me and I'd want to come right back. Um, so at the end of freshman year, I pretty much avoided going home for an extended period of time all year. And so the three months of summer were coming and I was terrified. I was like, how am I going to go home and just like, how, like how, like it just can't happen. So I decided to find a job on campus and I stuck around. Um, and it was a good summer. I worked and I uh, volunteered on a campaign, but I had a little bit too much time to think. And by the end of the summer, I decided it was finally time to confront my feelings about home, because I, I, even at this point, I hadn't like attributed it to anything. So I tried maybe to like try another white thing, and I booked an appointment with Student Psychological Services, <laughs> and uh, I went to um, therapy, which is like could never tell my parents that they'd be like, "What do you need therapy for?" But, okay. <laughs> So I went, and for the first time, I admitted to someone out loud that I missed home so bad. But I also hated the thought of being there. And slowly but surely, through a couple sessions, she got me to like really uncover the things that I had buried deep, deep down, and really confront the fact that like the thing that happened like actually affected me, which when I had been pretending that it hadn't for so long. More importantly, she forced me to address the fact that I had blamed my parents, my teachers, my school, my friends, my community at large for like letting me go through this alone and like just not, I blamed them for letting this happen. I don't, I just wanted someone to tell me that it was okay or that I wasn't crazy for feeling so uncomfortable and no one ever did. And so I blamed them and I um, have to work through that now. So I am now proud to say that I'm working on that. 
but here's where it's complicated. So I, the first step was just dealing with that emotion. I was sad for a long time um, at the start of the school year, actually, because like I said, I didn't go to SPS until the summer. And I just, for the first time, I was told that it was okay to cry about things that happened. So even though I was crying a whole year and a half later, I was still crying. And I felt a lot better after that. And now I'm in a place where I'm moving on. And so I feel like the only way I'll ever be able to truly get past this is if I forgive people, even if we may not think they need forgiving. So I'm trying to think of it in terms of like separating, like I'm separating the actions of a few from my community as a whole. I'm separating machismo culture and like the thought of like degrading women and how I'm not supposed to be talking too much from the men that I love. I am separating my hurt from my home. And this has been a really, really big, messy challenge that I can only work through one day at a time. But a lot of people at LMU, many of whom are here in this room today, have helped me because they've, um, I came to LMU feeling like a failure after just an unsuccessful year, and they showed me, or they made me feel, that there was still some light and potential in me after I was so sure that the light had gone out forever. And so even though this story is about what happens next, <laughs> I can tell you. <laughs> it's complicated right now, and we're working through that right now. Um, and I think that things are getting better. I, over winter break, I shared one of the incidents, the photo incidents with my mom. She had no idea what had happened. And I got really supported and acknowledged when I shared that with her. And um, so I feel like we're going to get there. And I feel like Ellen is helping me out. So going back to Angie, there was a time in our lives where I really did think that we were going to stop being friends, or our lives were just going to lead us in two different directions. But naturally, we found our way back, and we're closer than we ever were before. It's almost like the distance made our relationship stronger. I think that's what's happening right now with home. I'm taking some time apart because I need it. I need to be away while I process everything, but I know that eventually this little loop is just going to lead me right back to the place I love the most. Because as long as it takes, and no matter how hard it gets, I won't give up on myself, and I won't give up on my community. Thank you. I tore down the trumpet. No, I tore it down. No, I tore it down. <laughs> the day that changed my life forever and my family's life. That's the day that my brother Luis Antonio Gutierrez passed away. It was a huge shock to us. The day before he was playing basketball, he went out for a layup and the hidden aneurysm in the back of his head erupted. He fell down, he never got back up, slipped in a coma. I still remember the funeral services and everybody saying, I hope you'll be okay. And I'm really sorry for your loss. And in God's time, things will heal. I fucking hated those responses. Mm -hmm. After the funeral, our family was devastated. 18 years old. I was 14. My eldest brother went back to Los Angeles. He went back to work. Try to forget that his best friend is no longer there. Try to forget that his partner in crime was missing. My father, who was always busy with work, two jobs, just now became emotionally detached from our family. My mother, the breadwinner, 
hadn't gone to work in months. She was on the verge of losing her job, and we were on the verge of losing our house. My sister, who had a lot of resentment and judgment for what my brother did before this time, never had the opportunity to reconcile. Never had the opportunity to say, I'm sorry. So amidst all this pain and the sadness, what was I going to do? Because nobody was doing anything. So I decided, and I'm not sure if it was a decision because I was the youngest, to follow my mom every Sunday and go to church. We didn't grow up in a traditional Latino home. We didn't pray to the Virgin Mary on Fridays. We didn't have cena con la gran familia arriba. We didn't go to catechism. I was baptized at nine, and the only reason I did my communion is because I wanted to get married. <laughs> and because she said yes. But I went to church because somebody had to. And for a whole year, we went every Sunday, St. John of the Cross at Lemon Grove, down the street from where we lived. After church, we would go to the cemetery, we'd visit Luis. She talked, I'd stay quiet. We'd walk around the ground, see the other tombstones. And then we'd go home. And for a year, we did that, like clockwork. And I still remember some of the homilies, the, the beautiful vision of God. This great deity that knows all, that loves you, that cherishes you, that has plans for everyone, that knows exactly what he, she, or they are doing. Fuck that. They like it. And there was one sermon, one Sunday that I remember distinctly. It was Palm Sunday, and the church had organized an actor to come in and play Judas in a one-person play. And I remember this actor, and I remember... The whole play, there's one part of me that I really, really remember. He was explaining when Judas knew that he was going to betray Jesus, and at this time, even Judas felt the love of Jesus. And he said, and I still remember his emotional cry, can't, can't you see that even me, Jesus loved me, that even me, I had love. And I remember sitting there, not wanting to be there. And I was like, Jesus doesn't love me. God did not love my brother. And if he did, what was the reason why he was taken? What was the reason for that? God and his plans. Were Luis's plans not good enough? You see, Luis, prior to his passing, spent two years in a correctional facility. He, uh, like a lot of kids in the neighborhood, did some stupid stuff. Got caught selling weed. He was convicted. But he had found Jesus there. And he decided that three months, that's all he needed. That's all that was left of his stay. That he was going to rebuild his life. That he was going to rebuild his connections with his community. That he was going to rebuild his connections with his family. That he wanted to be a cop or a firefighter. So that he can still tell students and kids where we grew up that you don't have to follow your stupid friends, that you don't have to follow your stupid friends and sell drugs to make a living, that you can do something better. That was his plan. I think that's a pretty damn good plan. But what about my plan? The youngest of four wanting all my family there when I was the one who first graduated high school. What about that plan? What about going to the prom? <coughs> Because Luis was always a sexy one, he was always a cute one, beautiful hair, knew how to dress up. I couldn't ask him for advice, and God bless my other brother, but that's just not his style. <laughs> what about that plan? What about the plan and the idea that one day when I get married, I would have both? My brother's there. Was that not good enough for this deity? Was that not good enough for this God? I became very angry. I became very dismayed, and it lasted for years. December 2000, I just finished my first quarter, for those of you who quarters a 10-week system, at UC Davis, and I come home, and it was a challenging quarter. I wasn't getting advisement, so I took two freshman flunkers. I took Econ 1 and I took poli Sci 1 in the same quarter, um, and I failed. Yeah, no, I don't do that. So I was on the verge of getting kicked out of school. Because at that time, there were no, we'll help you out, 
just either you make it or you don't. And I didn't tell anybody. I really didn't. I, I, how could I? The, the first one to graduate high school and now go to college and not graduate? Child, I, I can't do that. Well, my parents are going to, why, why can't you go to school? It's learning. It's just sitting down in front of the class. No. Nope. So I went home that summer, that December. I was pissed. I was mad at myself. I was mad at the teachers because they couldn't teach me right. I was mad at the school system because I shouldn't have taken those classes. I was mad at the quarter system. I should have stayed home. And I was really mad because I didn't have a Luis to talk to. December 22nd, my birthday. Same year. I turned 19. And I remember my family, we went out to dinner. You know, we sang Los Mayanitas, the birthday song. I came home. Everybody went to their rooms. And I just sat down. I was like, all right, cool. I'm 19. Two more years till 21. Whew. I'm 19. Another year. Oh, shit, I'm 19. Why is that important? I am now older than when Luis died. What the? I am now older and will forever be older than my older brother Luis. Man, that, that tripped me out. To know that at 18 he was gone. And to know that he had a full life, but no longer. That did something to me. That, that really changed me. And the realization was that I was still here. The realization was that I still had breath. I still had days. And that changed me. I realized that all this hurt and all this anger and all this frustration and all this unknowing didn't really do anything. And what I needed to do was what Luis did all the time. For all his shenanigans, for all his gizmadas, he was a fighter. When he wanted something, he got it. If he wanted the girl, he got the girl. If he wanted the car, well, he got the car. And if he wanted the job, he got the job. And unfortunately, if he wanted to do some bad things, he did some bad things. But whatever he wanted to do, he got it done. And I thought, if he was here, he would do it ten times better than I so I went back the winter quarter, not spring semester, winter quarter, and I grinded. It was hard, it was tough, and every time I complained, every time I worried about my grades, every time I didn't understand something, I sat back and I thought, what would Luis do? Well, he wouldn't complain. He would keep going. He would find tutoring. He would find this. He would find that. He would grind that shit out because that's what he was. I started writing little things, of course, si se puede. <laughs> but I put them differently. I said, Luis wouldn't give up, so why the fuck are you? <laughs> Luis would do it ten times better, so stop whining. Luis was better than you, so you need to kick ass. And these became motivation, these became things for me, because what I realized was that I still had days. When I realized was that I was still here, and the life I needed to live was not my own. The life I needed to live now was for Luis. And that fueled me. It fueled me to graduate undergrad, to move to Los Angeles, to get a job, to find a beautiful partner and get married, to go get a master's, and now work on my doctorate. It fuels me. Because for me, that's what he would have done. He became my inspiration, and that's what he left. His plan, whether through life or through death, was to give us hope and to give us the possibility that we are better than where we stand now. I didn't understand it at 14. I still didn't get it at 19, and I barely <laughs> understand a little bit at 37. But he's still with me. We still have the same blood in our veins. I still have his ganas, I still have his passion, and I still have days left. Thank you. Let's get a big round of applause for all our speakers here.
library programming team, the head of outreach and communications, John Jackson. Uh, the, the manager of special events, Carol Raby. Uh, assistant librarian, Stephanie Wright. The librarian of collection and development and evaluations. Did I get that right? Jamie Hayes. <laughs> and our, uh, our poster designer, uh, Tess Reed. Yeah, just. <laughs> I want to thank the Dean of the Library, Chris Brangolini. Thank you very much. Thank you for this event. And a huge thank you, of course, to the Senior Director of uh, Ethnic and Cultural uh, Student Affairs, Andy Ward. <laughs> Always finding the students and encouraging them to come and be a part of this. It, just, it would not be the same event without you. So we're very grateful that you're here and grateful to you uh, for your participation. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. And thank you to everyone here in advance for filling out your feedback forms. <laughs> and, yes, so when you complete that, please put it in the, the nice little box here and, and continue to hang out with us. Go get some food, get something to drink, and continue sharing with the, the speakers and, and, and everyone else. So thank you all for being here and have a great night. Thank you.